Hey everybody, Nick Nanton here. Thanks for joining us live. This is for my podcast, Now to Next, and I've got a great guest for you today, uh, a guy I've gotten to know, uh, to know pretty well over the last uh, few months since I've read his book, and I can assure you that it's a book well worth reading. Uh, one thing you want to write down right now is the Bezos letters, uh, and I'm not going to tell you too much about it. I'm going to let the guy who wrote the book on it tell you. <laughs> there it is. Steve will show it to us. Uh, it's my good friend, Steve. There you go. Welcome, Steve. How you doing, man? Nick, hello. Oh. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure, man. And so, look, you are uh, traditionally, let's talk a little bit about your background, because certain things, we would never guess where the road leads us. Uh, you are <laughs> an IT risk consultant that ended up writing this incredible book we're going to talk about. Give us uh, the 90 seconds on your, your career and what led you to write this book. Sure. Uh, I've been in the insurance business uh, virtually my entire career. So uh, worked in two different independent insurance agencies, one in the Washington, D.C. area, one in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Got really interested in the technology there. I mean, I, and this is, again, early 2000s, you know, websites and and database systems and policy tracking and, you know, SEO and all those kinds of things. Um 20 years ago, started my own firm doing research, speaking, writing, consulting in those areas, right? How technology is impacting that, that uh, business. And that's led me to really start understanding a few years ago that the pace of technology change is actually the biggest risk businesses face. You know, so in the past, businesses of all sizes would have some time, a year, two years maybe, to kind of figure a new technology out, see how it's going to impact them, start working with it. And today's pace, we just don't have that. And so the biggest risk is not taking enough risk, right? Not moving forward quickly enough. So that led me to start researching companies that had done it well or not done it well and came across Amazon as a company over the years, really for 25 years now, continues to be known for invention and innovation. Came across the uh, Bezos letters to shareholders. So they went public in 97. Um, at the time I started researching for the book, there were 20 letters, uh, now there are 21. Um, and really was got captured by reading those letters. And uh, so the, the book is the, the end result of that reading, research, kind of deep dive into Re them. Reading 21 years worth of shareholder letters. So Jeff Bezos, if you're watching, there's actually someone reading those. And what I think <laughs> is, is fascinating is obviously – you know, one of the things that many people probably just completely gloss over in many cases and tons of public businesses are shareholder letters because they can tend to be dry. Uh, and it's typically they come across I don't know, like most of the stuff that is long like that comes across the time when I'm not planning for it. I just chuck it out or like, oh, I'll get to that later. But I don't spend time to and I'm sure many of them may not be worth reading. I don't know. But they're trying to impress shareholders, by the way. They're trying to right. keep shareholders. So it's a really interesting format to think about. And you decided you're going to dig through these shareholder letters and do the work for us so that we did not have to uh, do it ourselves. And, and you distilled what 14 principles that correct out of the out of those correct 14 principles i group them into four cycles test build accelerate and scale excellent and so i'm going to talk with you today first of all you should again get the book the audio book whichever one you like uh the bezos letters it's it's an incredible book it's really changed the way i talk about a lot of things so i highly suggest it um and i'm just going to get into a few of my favorite concepts i think will be helpful okay. for people here steve sure uh and so uh one of the first things i heard you say that really resonated with me it was actually another interview as i was preparing for an interview we did a while back i saw you say something to the tune of well if you're not having the success or if you're not worried you want to be in your business I probably could say that in your life as well by the way it's probably mm -hmm. because you're not taking enough risk and it's fascinating for me to hear a risk consultant encourage <laughs> you to take risk and you have a concept in the book called return on risk so tell us a little bit about all of that yeah yeah so i mean that is the 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 weird twist is that you know obviously coming out of the insurance business everything i did for years was to help businesses reduce the risk they're exposed to right financial risk somebody slips and falls on a sidewalk a product doesn't work right right all of those kinds of things and as i said when i started that that started changing or my mindset started changing a bit when i realized that technology and its pace of change 
that the businesses that have failed, you know, some big names like BlackBerry and Kodak and Blockbuster, and right, we've got lots of names there, Sears, I think a lot of that was due to their inability to speed up how they look at that. So that that's where this concept of the biggest risk is not taking enough risk. And the uh, ROR, right, return on risk idea is that to get your mind around this idea of taking more risk, it's looking at, okay, what return do we get on the risk that we take? And very similar to return on investment, right? Where if I'm going to spend marketing dollars on Facebook or Google, you know, I want a certain number of dollars back in sales and I want to be able to justify. We don't look at risk that way. And I think we should, um, especially in today's world, kind of that continued exponential change and development and new stuff coming. And, you know, we could look at all kinds of things that are still coming. Autonomous vehicles, machine learning, Right, all you know, DNA sequencing, right? I mean, there's all kinds of technology and not be afraid of it, but be willing to step into it and figure out how can we use it in business to grow. That's that's great. A book, another book, by the way, if you want to check out that concept and blow your mind with autonomous vehicles and drones, or anything, is uh, Peter Diamandis' book, The Future is Faster Than You Think. Uh, it's yep. amazing. It talks about the convergence of all these technologies, and it's truly a great book. Uh, Steve, you also talk about, well, so much of this is built in and baked into Amazon's culture. And so yes. uh, that is a huge piece that I don't know how much we'll talk about by itself today, but in everything we're talking about, it's baked in the culture. This one particularly, another concept uh, from the book and from Jeff Bezos is encourage successful failures. Again, uh, unwrap that for me. There's a lot in that. <laughs> there is. And, you know, again, generally you don't hear those two words used together, right? Successful failure. Uh, and it, the, the, the phrase actually comes from the Apollo 13 movie, Ron Howard, uh, uh, created, produced in 1995, talking about the Apollo 13 mission. And at the very end of that movie, Tom Hanks is stepping off the helicopter after getting, you know, lifted out of the water after they got back successfully. Um, and he narrates that our mission, Apollo 13, became known as NASA's most successful failure. Failure in that they didn't hit the mission goal, which was to land on the moon success and they got all three astronauts got back alive and I, again i think in business where we talk about the need for innovation the problem is is that you've got to be right right we punish the failure that absolutely is required in order to be able to invent new things uh, and bezos talks about this a lot and he talks about experimentation that experimentation by its very nature means you don't know if you're going to be successful. If you do, it's not an experiment, right? And that again, that's kind of that paradox of failure in terms of we don't ever want to fail. But I'm absolutely convinced that people don't fear failure as much as they fear the consequences of failure. You know, so in a business, is their career going to take a hit if they try something and it doesn't work out the way they thought? Well, Bezos says in his letters, he believes Amazon is the best place in the world for an employee to fail. Now, what CEO of a company talks that way? Right. But it's that mindset and it's building in a culture of being not even willing, but being embracing the experimentation needed to invent. And in fact, I say the whole focus on invention or excuse me, innovation today is backwards. It needs to be experimentation, invention, and then innovation. I, I uncover that a little bit because I don't want I don't want people to miss that point. I, I can't think of a company today that doesn't say we need to innovate. Right. But innovates assuming you've already got something that you've invented that you want to make better. Innovation is taking something you've done and, and tweaking it, making it better. But in order to invent, you've got to experiment. So that the process really is experimentation to be able to invent something new. And again, in, in Bezos speak, to be able to invent on behalf of the customer. And that is the mindset at Amazon. And, and let me be really clear here. Amazon does not tolerate incompetence. 
So it's not stupid, just try anything, throw it against the wall, see what happens. It's intentional. It's strategic. They, they think through all the issues beforehand as much as they possibly can, but they also understand that we, would, we are not going to get everything right the first time. So experiment, invent, learn, repeat, right? Do it all over again. And, and that's that constant culture at Amazon that every employee is expected to be experimenting and inventing all the time. That's great. And these are just a couple of the concepts, by the way, that if you're just joining us, this is Steve Anderson, the author of the Bezos Letters, the book. You need to get it, read it, listen to it, however you do that. Uh, we just covered the concept of encouraging successful failures. And if you aren't failing, you aren't trying enough things that could absolutely revolutionize your business. I mean, Steve, I don't know how many times there, there have been in my business, but it's been, you know, I've been, we've been in business about 15 years in this business that I've, you know, one idea has completely shifted the trajectory of my business. And um, maybe it hasn't happened enough times, but it's funny because the day before something, you know, it, it is possible, it's just a crazy idea. And there's mm -hmm. been so many times when I actually, um, we've probably done, I don't want to overestimate, but over $20 million for sure in sales of a particular product and service that we offer. And the day that before I tried it, I was speaking with a guy who said, well, yeah, you could offer that to my audience, but I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're going to buy it. Do you have anything else? And when he's like, well, it sounds like that other thing's probably the best thing you got. Um, I did a, <laughs> you know, the next day I spoke on a stage and people hired me to the tune of close to a hundred thousand dollars. If I recall correctly for that <laughs> one thing. And then it went on over the last 15 years to do, I, I'm going to guess probably more like 30 plus million dollars in sales. But the day before that, it was just, ah, would this work? Would I, and had I not tried it, had I not been willing to, and right. the hardest part about, you know, especially in the world of uh, speaking and selling from stage, um, it's real easy to wrap your self-worth up in mm -hmm. the success or failure of that, of that experiment. And you just have to be willing to just set it aside and say, you know, uh, what I'm going to do today is just, teach the people the most I can. I'm going to try to make them an offer to help do something great for them. And if they take me up on a great, if they don't, Oh, well, I did my best, but I've seen right. a lot of people uh, crater when they, when they, they call it rolling a donut. When you, you sell zero from <laughs> something, when you have the opportunity to sell millions. Uh, right. I, I've done it many times. One of the things that, as I started this podcast and this podcast really became uh, the result of my dealing with, you know, the, the quarantine, the COVID-19, uh, mm -hmm. and how to deal with, um, what should I do next? So I could always, I could always just sit here and watch Netflix for 47 hours a day, but that's not really <laughs> my deal, but it's really how, how could I, and should I, um, utilize what I have access to, to help nurture, you know, any audience that cares to pay attention to. Um, I feel like anyone who has any audience has a responsibility to that audience to try to lead them. Now, one of the things that I didn't understand, one of the reasons I'd been told, I, I had some, you can see if you go on iTunes now, quite a few false starts on my own podcast, mm -hmm. or on my YouTube channel. I had, uh, I've been on a ton of other podcasts, but there was something nagging in the back of my mind that you uncovered in the book through Jeff Bezos's language. That's one of the reasons I think I didn't start it a long time ago, and it's because, like many, um, well, Dan Sullivan said today to me on a call, I thought it was great, um, you can't watch yourself and play the game at the same time, and when you're playing mm -hmm. the game, you often don't realize what the what you're bringing to the game because you're in the middle of the thick of playing it, and I was worried that, you know, I, I don't want to just be another also ran podcast. I don't want to just another noise on the bajillions of podcasts in the podcast world world. And what I really was saying to myself, uh, at least self-consciously, is I don't know how I'm going to bring, and this is the term you introduced mm -hmm. me to the book, meaningful differentiation to the world mm -hmm. of podcasts. How can I be meaningfully different? And I love those two words together. Anybody can be different. And as uh, another, I'm sure you must know her too, Sally Hogshead says, you know, different is better than better. And I love that because being different is better than better. You just you got to be different. But being meaningfully different, now that to me is something worth hanging on to. And so as I looked through my skill sets, my network, and everything, I realized that at the end of the day, I could be meaningfully different because I have a unique perspective, unique angle, unique life experiences, unique network of people I could bring on the show like you. But I was hiding behind not understanding what my meaningful differentiation could be. That's an example that I would use for that term, meaningful differentiation. But uh, go ahead and expound on that in any way you like. 
Um, so a couple things come to mind. Um, that first that first phrase of his called meaningful meaningfully differentiated really comes out of a question he was asked in 2006 that he wrote about you know Jeff when are you going to open physical stores and he kind of goes into this fairly long description of why they wouldn't at this point and one of the point there were several one of the points was we don't know how to do retail stores any better than it's being done now and so that was 2006. Fast forward to about five years ago, uh, they began experimenting. Again, I'll go back to that. They began experimenting with a new concept for retail. And it was the, the first iteration opened in Seattle at their headquarters, and now they have, I, I think, 25, 26, 27 Amazon Go stores, G-O. And Amazon Go store has meaningfully differentiated the retail shopping experience because there is no cashier. So think about going to the grocery store. What's the worst thing about going to the grocery store? Whoa. Checking out. Yeah, the, even the worst thing than a cashier checking out is the damn self the self at like self checkout or Home Depot. Like I just yep. want to murder someone because it never it, works right. It never it never seems to work right. Well, on Amazon Go, you scan a, an app right to get in. So it opens the doors, and they track you when you're inside the store. And when you're ready to leave, you just walk out. And they have they understand what you've picked off the shelves. They understand what you've put in your drinks and chips and whatever else. So that was their first. They took over five years of experimenting, testing, tweaking to get that concept down right. So now they've opened in Seattle an Amazon Go grocery store. Same concept, but the Amazon Go store was a small convenience store, 1,000, 1,500 square feet. The Amazon Go grocery store is a 10,000 square foot grocery store. But here's what's also different. Amazon is licensing that technology to other retailers that want to create that same experience in their own stores. And that's where Amazon really thinks in big ways, meaning, yeah, we'll develop this, but you know what? There's probably a lot of retail stores that could take advantage of this. So we can also make money licensing the technology mm. that we've invented and at the same time increase their customer satisfaction. So that's that's that idea of how do we be different. The other one, real quick, Nick, that comes to mind is the Kindle. Yep. First released in 2007. And as Bezos says, we had the audacious goal of reinventing something that's been in the same format for 500 years, yes. a book. Yep. And he said what we realized when we started exploring this is that the characteristics of a good book when you're reading it is the book fades away and you actually enter the author's world. So we needed to create a device that also faded away, but enhanced the book reading experience. Now, I don't know whether you like Kindle or not. I do. And if it's a book I suspect I want to take notes on, yeah. highlight things, I will always buy the Kindle because it's so easy to highlight and then I can go to the website and I now have created my own executive summary of that book. How do you, can so, you take notes in the Kindle? That's one thing I'm not clear on because I don't use yes. the Kindle. You can't. Yes. Uh, so it's a similar function of when you highlight, but you can actually do an actual note and make your notes. And again, on the kindle.amazon.com website, for that book, you will see your notes and all your highlights. Wow. So okay. So uh, another thing that maybe they haven't promoted so well is that you can. There's another way to access these things. It's not just on the Kindle itself. There's, in fact, a better way probably to access your notes. Yeah. Well, you. I mean, it, you know, they're pretty much on every device. So the actual physical Kindle. Sometimes I use it on my desktop. Uh, if I'm doing research and I want to do that on my phone, either iOS or Android, you know, there are multiple ways for you to consume. And here's another principle with that. When they created the Kindle, they created what's called Whisper Sync. So if I'm reading a book on my phone and I go to my iPad, 
the Kindle app will ask me, do you want to sync this copy of the book to the last place you finished reading from your phone? And you can say yes or no. So yeah, yes, automatically synced. They they started with that. That's a that's a massive technology problem, right? All those different instances having to keep them all synced together and right. Think about syncing your email. How difficult that is. They also do net, that now with Audible. So I can be listening to a book, and then I want to go read now instead of listen. It will sync my book to where I last where I stopped listening. If I make a bookmark in Audible, will it bookmark the Kindle too? I believe it will, but I don't. I won't guarantee it. Okay, that I need to check because I have not done it. Because <laughs> I usually read my audiobooks as I'm running, uh, and so I like I like I'm taking notes on my phone as I keep notes. running, and it's yep. dangerous. It's definitely not. I don't. Recommend <laughs> it. Uh, but if I could just find a way to mark it and I could go back and find it to highlight, uh, would be amazing. Because yep. I make uh, I read the books through Audible, and I didn't. I really didn't understand. Still, I remember now reading in your book or listening to it. Uh, I'm gonna because there are times when I'm really going through something like, man, I need to see this in writing or I need to be able to share this with the team or whatever. So I will mm -hmm. uh, now. So the beauty of that now, Amazon put a bajillion dollars into making that technology, I'm sure, but they're going to get yes. two sales instead of one now for me, for sure. Correct. So yep. that makes it yep. work. Um, that makes it work. Cool. Uh, again, those of you just joining us, uh, this is Steve Anderson, the author of the Bezos letters. He's taken the principles that Jeff Bezos has used that he shares through his now 21 shareholder letters and distills them down for us uh, and helps us use them in our business. I'm really here going over some of my top 10 favorites, uh, but I highly recommend that you check out the book. Um, we talked a little bit about it already, uh, but if there's any more to add about it, he encourages uh, practicing dynamic invention and then innovation. We talked mm -hmm. a little bit about it through success successful failures um and you talked about most businesses have it backwards so maybe we've covered that fully but anything else to add to dynamic invention yeah, innovation? I would, yeah i would say the reason dynamic is in there is that every employee is expected to do this this is not a r d part department that's off somewhere you know with with the people who invent every employee is expected to look at the processes that they're using and and determine new better different ways uh, to do it. And any employee can bring up an idea. And if it's a good idea and they can support it, they may actually be tapped to actually run that idea and, and, and bring it forward. So that's where the dynamic part of that comes from. And that's another culture issue, right? So in a lot of companies, yes. people have scared employees from the top to the bottom with staying in their own lane. Oh, you're not responsible mm -hmm. for trying to figure out how to innovate this thing. Uh, at Amazon, again, you said they don't let they don't let you be careless or irresponsible or stupid, but they encourage you. If you see something you think could be better, uh, you know, let's let's look at innovating it. Um, that's, yep. and and it's almost you have an obligation to. I mean, that's what's put, that's, that's the mindset. You have an obligation, if you think there's a better way to do it, to say something. And, and I think that culturally is very different than most. You're right. At, at, I won't say there are no fiefdoms at Amazon, but I would say there are a significantly fewer than you'd find at most companies. Uh, got that. And it's a huge company, so that has to be difficult to accomplish anyway. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyway, uh, correct. Um, the next one I want to go to is something that, uh, a lot of people talk about, but I would say they're not, they don't do it. They, they give it more lip service than real service. And so one of the principles I love is, is customer obsession, obsessing over your customers. And there's many examples mm -hmm. of where, uh, Jeff Bezos took the long-term view, uh, of something that really didn't look profitable up front in order to create the customer obsession that would create loyalty. Cause that's really what he's after. Um, give us some right. stories about that. So I think the word obsess, and that is his word, and, and actually he writes about customer obsession in the very first letter, 1997, and it's a theme throughout. And, you know, it's customer obsession, inventing on behalf of the customer, starting with the customer and working backward. Those are all phrases that continue to be used uh, by Bezos and uh, by Amazon. And I think obsession is an interesting word because you're right, I mean, Every company knows they take care of customers. We try and improve the customer experience. We provide customer service. We, you know, customer journey, all of those kinds of things. But obsessing just has a different take to it. Uh, some of it could be negative, right? You know, we kind of think of obsession maybe as too much. Uh, and, and I would argue 
it's seldom that a company obsesses too much over their customer. Um, you know, Am Amazon certainly is, is one. And everything starts with the customer. What does the customer want? And again, this phrase I've used, invent on behalf of the customer, is really a core mindset there. No customer was asking for Amazon Prime. Nobody was asking for free two-day shipping. But what they realized was that was a point of friction that when people went to actually pay for something and that, you know, shipping is going to cost you X, $5.95, $9.99, whatever it is, that became a friction point that stopped people from buying more. And Bezos said, what if we took that away? And they tried experiments. They, you know, had... Um, Super saver shipping. If you bought $99 or more, you got free shipping. They, and then, then they dropped it to $25. And so they tried out. But this is an example where the senior leadership team thought it was a crazy idea that they shouldn't do. We can't afford to pay for shipping. And Bezos said, if it's better for our customers, it will be better for Amazon and our share owners. And so they, they went you know, all in on it, uh, really against his team. He said, no, we're going to do this. And, you know, again, look at, look at what's happened, right? It's become, it's become a core in the e-commerce online shopping industry. It's become a core uh, offering that you pay for shipping. And if you don't, it becomes a problem. Yeah, and, and one of the key things you said there that I think is so important is is friction free. It tries to make it friction yes. free for the customer. So, for instance, there have been many instances recently. So, Facebook is doing. There's a lot of companies that are doing direct to consumer goods through Facebook now. I mean, there's uh, the cowboy boot company Tacovas. There's, I mean, bird dogs. There's the shorts. There's so many things. And there's been so many times I've just clicked through one of those things and said, "Oh, check this out," and then. Even if I add something to my cart and I go to maybe check out, like all of a sudden I'm like, uh, and you could call it lazy, but it's where we're all at. I think I got to take my credit card. Out. I, gotta, I got to enter everything. I don't have time to do that right now. I don't. Mm -hmm. want, I don't want to do that. Maybe I'm at a stoplight, right? I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't have enough time before I got to start driving again or whatever it is. And so, uh, because you shouldn't text and drive, and so um, yeah, or, or <laughs> buy and drive. And so, as I'm doing that, like two things that have really shifted that experience is um, number one. Now, a lot, a lot of those websites have Amazon Pay. So if I can, if I just see that right. button that I can check out with Amazon, like. Oh, Boom. They got everything I need. The other one that we're trying to implement right. in our business that is proving harder than I thought it would be is Apple Pay. Because I think actually Apple yes. Pay is the easiest of any payment solution I've ever used. You know, you just you got the cards in there, okay. you pick it, you double you double click and you they scan your face and you can move on. And it's any done. website yep. I go to that gives me Apple Pay, I'm like, I'm in. This is so easy. Like even now, uh, like when I order the kids pizza or whatever, like even the Pizza Hut app now has Apple Pay. It's like, oh, I can just decide so seamlessly becoming friction free investing and in becoming friction free for your business can really right. grow uh and that leads us to you know the investing in that sort of technology making long-term investments is does become an unfair advantage by the way you have to take that risk and experiment yes. but this applies to the next thing we're going to talk about which is applying long-term thinking i love the fact that Jeff Bezos calls his shareholders share owners because he wants you to think yep. like an owner, not a share, you know, not a shareholder, just someone who's holding it for the short term gain. Talk not just that. not just an investor. Yeah, he, he and actually even in his 97 letter, one of the interesting things there is, you know, he, he talks directly to, to people who own shares um, and he, he made that shift to share owners about 2007, 2008. And, and he was like, okay, here is how I'm going to run Amazon. It's going to be long term. We're going to reinvest because we feel like that infrastructure investment is going to pay off in the long term. I am not going to worry about quarterly Wall Street projections. And he pretty much single-handedly has done that, at least for Amazon. Other companies have tried and, and to, to different levels of success to, to, to take that long-term view. Um, but he believes very strongly that owners are different than tenants. So share owners, and he was like, you know what? If the, if you're coming in to make a quick buck, that's pro we're probably not the right place for you. But if you're in for the long term, yeah, I think this is the right the right play. He also does that for employees. So 
early on, Am- Amazon paid below market for employees, salaries and benefits. I mean, they obviously have really good salaries and really good benefits, but people could make more money elsewhere. But what he did do ha- was have a very generous stock option program. You know, so people made money on the stock and he said, you know what, if we're going to have employees that I want them to think like owners, they actually have to be owners. And again, a different concept. And think about that in any business, that if you made employees owners in whatever form or fashion that might work for your business, would that change the decisions they make every single day? And I would argue, yes, I think it might. Because now they're thinking what's what's best for the company is going to be best for me uh, as a shareholder. And we've heard this concept through uh, everything from sports to hobbies and the classroom, take ownership. And that's what we all want our, our team to do, our employees, is want to take ownership. So giving them a reason to take ownership in any way, shape, or form you can, we see this with everything from commissions to other strategies for doing so. Right. That really is what, yep. that, what that comes down to. That's awesome. Now, the next one is a concept. I had never heard of because I uh, embarrassingly had not read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. (laughs) It's been on my list forever. It's now even further on my list. You talk about understanding your flywheel, which is a concept out of that. And now there's like a, a mini book out of the, that book right. that's out. And I did, I did listen to that. So I've gotten there so far. Um, okay. The, the All right. Flywheel is a fascinating concept that I think if anyone just was lucky enough to tune in right now and you could give them a 90 second discussion or three minutes, whatever on the flywheel, tell us about what that is and how you can use it because it's a fascinating concept. Yeah, I and, and I would. What I say is, I actually, if I had to pick one principle as kind of the most important, it would be this one. And, and um, it's principle number six, uh, and and it's actually understand your flywheel. So it comes out of Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, Chapter Eight. It's called the Flywheel and the Doom Loop. Uh, so if you have that book on your shelf, which you likely do. Don't worry about reading anything else. Go to chapter eight and just kind of, and it's pretty dense, but go ahead and read through that. The concept here, and and here's how it happened and how it impacted Amazon. That book, Good to Great, was published in October of uh, uh, 2001. Collins was invited to the Amazon, uh, to Amazon leadership team kind of offsite annual uh, meeting. And he taught specifically about that chapter, the flywheel. And the senior leadership team, called the S team, started sketching out what they thought Amazon's flywheel was. Uh, and you can see a picture of it in the book, or you can go to Amazon's um, you know media relations pl- uh, area on their website, and you can see it. You can see it there. But it it is what Bezos thought at the time was their secret sauce. In fact, he didn't want anybody to talk about it outside the company. Because he thought it was that important, and they and, and the core idea is what are the inputs that I need to put into this business to make it grow? And for Amazon, you know, the core of the flywheel is growth. That's what they wanted. And for them, it was the easier we make the website, the more people will come and shop there. The, the more people that come and shop there, the more they'll tell their friends and family about Amazon.com. That will bring more people in. That'll give us the leverage to negotiate lower prices with manufacturers. And so, and and then when they started adding the delivery piece, that just was another reason. And then they added in the early 2000s the Amazon marketplace, allowing third-party sellers to sell on Amazon site. That brought more third-party which brought more sales, which gave them more negotiating power. It just kept pushing that flywheel to go faster and faster. And even today, if you look at what Amazon's doing, they're still pushing on that flywheel. And these, all these ideas, the, I think the key point to me in the flywheel is they're all interconnected and related. They drive you around Correct. the circle of the flywheel to keep to go again and to go faster and faster and faster which creates perpetual motion which is what every every business is after i don't want to have to worry what every business is after too hard about it yeah exactly so uh yeah exactly i I highly recommend you read that book after you read steve's book the bezos letters (laughs) Uh, check it out um one of the things that was also uh again so many of these things really did shift the way i think about things uh because you brought them up but obviously steve uh, jeff has spent his life creating these concepts and ideas um you brought them to (laughs) most of us in the world um he talks about there's two types of decisions and this blew my mind uh because we typically don't 
separate decisions this way, and we agonize over all decisions sometimes the same way, and we shouldn't. So why don't you tell us about generating high-velocity decisions? Yeah, so that's in the, again, there were, there were four cycles, test, build, accelerate, and scale. And accelerate, the first principle there is to uh, generate high-velocity decisions. The way Bezos describes it is that there are two types of decisions, what he called type one and type two. Type one decisions are big, bet the farm, and we make those decisions slowly with as much data as we possibly can. The other type of decisions are type two decisions. Type two decisions are... Uh, easier to make, don't need as much data, and are reversible. And that's really a key difference between type 1 and type 2. Type 1 are hard to reverse if we make this decision, this move. Type 2 decisions are easy to reverse, um, you know, to pivot, to, to change. And, that's, and he says part of what happens at companies is they tend to move type 2 decisions into a type 1 process. And the way I describe that is how many layers of decision making do you have to go through to get a yes, right? And most decisions don't need any layers. You, you create a um, high quality staff with good judgment. You let them make a decision. You understand they're not going to be 100% right back to encourage successful failure, but you're also in know that they can make pivots quickly if it's not right one figure out what assumption did we make that wasn't right why wasn't it right we learn and let's make another decision as quickly and and kind of the example right now for me on amazon is within a couple week period they hired worldwide 175,000 new staff people to help in their fulfillment centers primarily to get stuff out because people were ordering online. They couldn't get out to stores. Right. They couldn't do these things. Amazon was overwhelmed. How did they do that? Well, they had this, you know, they had the structure in place. They, they scale every year during the holiday season. So they, they know how to do that. This was a kind of a step or two higher than that, but they were able to make decisions rapidly. They didn't have to go through all kinds of approval levels. They just did it because they know this is what we have to do. To And again, I go back to because we obsess over the customers, how do we take care of them? This is what we have to do. Absolutely. And, and many of us who've had our own businesses, there's times where we feel like we're creating more work for ourselves when our team continually comes back and asks us, what should I do here? 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 And that really, at the end of the day, that's our fault for not creating right. a culture of, hey, you can, you, know, you can make some of these decisions. Here's how. And I know you're never going to be perfect. Take some risks you know, and, and setting it up effectively. The key is you have to think it through and set it up effectively so that you are setting up a system that you're going to be happy with. And, of course, once you've right. invented that, you can innovate uh, and, and make it uh, even better. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I yep. think there's a huge, huge thing there. There's so many businesses that I've dealt with that, uh, and people are so frustrated, particularly in a lot of government settings that type two decisions get pushed into a type one framework. And, uh, there's yep. no, there's nobody that, uh, that, that makes excited to come back to work the next day. Well, and, and ultimately that just slows growth, right? You can't, you can't respond fast enough. Uh, to an environment that is changing it certainly as rapidly as ours is right now. Absolutely. I got two more principles here I want to talk with uh, Steve here about. Those of you watching, again, check out his book, uh, The Bezos Letters. It's great. Uh, this next one really brought a lot uh, of clarity to me. Um, Jeff Bezos uh, advises to only hire people you admire. We could go on yeah. about this for quite some time, but that's a fundamental shift. A lot of people hire someone to from let's even talk about an assistant. So although it's old school thinking, but typically people would think I'm going to hire an assistant um, to handle things that are beneath me. Let's call it that. Right. Things that I don't have time mm -hmm. to do. I don't want to schedule my appointments. I don't want to check my, whatever it is. But really what you need to be doing is hiring someone who's so much better than you at keeping up with the emails at at 
keeping up the people in your life to make sure your schedule is good. At, um, just that all these things that you don't love doing as, you know, my friend Dan Sullivan and mentor says, look, you work within your unique ability. And when you get burnt out mm -hmm. in life and business is when you're doing all the things that you're not good at. So outsourcing those things to people who are great at them is really what you should be looking at. And, and most people don't think of it when it comes to even when you hire someone who's going to clean your house or your office or that again, unfortunately, a lot of people will see, look down upon that. I'm looking for people who I admire because they love cleaning so much and they take so much pride. At, same thing with accounting. They, they take so much pride in getting those numbers just right, getting those percentages, letting you know the data so you can make great decisions. It's a total flip on the old school idea of especially hiring more entry level positions, but even mm -hmm. when it comes to hiring uh, C level positions, because a lot of people would think I'm going to hire people to do things, even though they're not as good as me or they can't do as good as me. No, you need to hire someone that they're so good at what they do. You admire them. That's my take on it. I'm interested to hear. Yeah. yours. Well, and, and I, I think that's part of it. By the way, I've got to say one of one of Dan's little books that really changed my thinking a lot is called Who Not How. Yes. Right. Not how am I going to do this, but who can I get to do this? And unique ability and all of that kind of stuff are just great, he's great concepts to help. By the way, uh, he wrote Dr. Ben Hardy, and he's coming on my podcast soon. The book Who Not How, sort of revealing the entire system behind that. Oh, cool. That's that'll be great. I'll look forward to that. Well, Bezos talks about this in the 1998 letter when he, you know, talks about. Um, in our hiring meetings, we ask people to consider three questions before a decision. And this kind of goes to this, um, the fourth cycle called scale, you know, which is focused on high standards. That's, that's really what we're talking about here. First question, just like you said, Nick, will you admire this person? Um, and, you know, it's they're coming into your team. Do you want them to, you know, be an integral part of that team? And are you going to feel good about them being there? The second question he asks is, will this person raise the average level of effectiveness of the group they're entering? And he goes on to describe that later as, will they raise the bar? In fact, he goes on uh, a, a couple of years later and talks about, you know, we want people at Amazon right now in these hiring meetings to think, boy, I'm glad I got here when I did because I don't think I could get a job today, right? That the bar has been raised enough. And that's how you maintain, you know, high standards within the organization. And the third one, I think, is also very interesting. Along what dimension will this person be a, you know, might this person be a superstar? And this is not job skill related. This is just who are they as a person? And he goes on to describe an employee at Amazon in 1998 as a national spelling bee champion. You know, they, they bring a dimension to their job because of excellence that they've done elsewhere. You know, and I love this. He says, you know, you can have some fun, you know, if this person's walking down the hall, you know, give them a quick challenge on a monopoeia, right? I mean, just, yeah. you know, it's kind of, it's fun, but it's also reinforcing this idea that we want people of high standards here and we want to not hire people to fill a position. We want to hire people that are going to fit into this culture. And that's something that's amazing to me how Amazon has continued that mindset. I agree. Another thing that reminds me of is you, know, you want to hire people you admire and who inspire you because of they're so good at something like a national spelling bee champion. Uh, again, we'll we'll give Dan Sullivan and strategic coach another great shout out. You know, he talks about people. There's two types of people: people who are batteries included and and others. And really, what you want, <laughs> is you want people who are you want people who are batteries included. They show up to whatever it is they're showing up to. I mean, if you're a sports right. coach, the same thing. Someone who's very motivated to be a great baseball player is probably very different than someone who wants to be a great accountant. I don't know. But whatever right. you're doing, you want people who show up and they just have a sense of accomplishment and you know, and just grit and hard work. You want people to show up ready to go, excited to do it. Um, yep. Which, Agreed. which really lays into this, this similar, this last concept is a similar idea sort of that binds us to. Um, he has the concept ingrained in their culture that no matter what day it is, and we're now 20, however many years in the business, always show up and believe it's day one, just like you were just getting started. Yep. 
Um, and this is a concept that he had in his very first letter and literally is woven throughout every letter. In fact, for probably the last 10 years, he ends every letter with, as is my, um, I forgot the word I want to use, but he always attaches the 1997 letter to every single letter since. And he has this phrase that he says, it's always day one. And in fact, in the 2019 letter, a lot was talked about in the pandemic and COVID and all of those kinds of things. What he says there is, even in today's world, it's still day one. And so this is a mindset. It's a concept. It's the idea that there was an excitement when you opened your business that first day. And, and he wants that to continue, that every day you to walk into your job, your business, your office, thinking of the excitement of being day one. And the way I like to describe this is how he describes it. He was asked in an all hands meeting, Jeff, what's day two look like? Right. So he, he talks about day one and he writes about this in the 2016 letter. And, you know, he basically says, Day two is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciating painful decline, followed by death. And that is why it's always day one. Um, and he goes on, to, and I think this is an important, you know, we've, a, a lot of times people sort of stop there. But he goes on to say, okay, how do you defend against a day two mindset creeping into your company? And he says... Uh, you know, I th I think you know day, it's called day you know day one vitality. How do you protect against that? Um, and he says, I, I I think there are four as I've thought about this. One is we've talked about customer obsession. Two is a skeptical view of proxies. So for Bezos, a proxy is a procedure that overtakes and overshadows a customer. You know, if you've ever had somebody say, well, well that's not our procedure. Or, well, I followed the procedure, but this happened. The procedure is a proxy. Proxies do not govern in the company. So skeptical view of, of those types of procedures. Um, and, and then an eager adoption of external trends. So paying attention to external trends so you know what's going on out there. And an eager adoption, not being afraid. And I think that's where a lot of companies get into problems is they – they start protecting their success instead of eagerly adopting what's new uh, and, and moving forward. And then fourth, we've talked about high velocity decision making, keeping that speed going. Those are all protecting the day one vitality. Love it. And there's even more you go into uh, quite a bit more in the book. So uh, please make sure you check out the Bezos letters. Uh, Steve, thanks for joining us here on Now to Next. And I look forward to continuing to see uh, what you're teaching next. And uh, and I'm sure our audience will be as well, man. Thanks so much. And thank you. Everybody. Oh, my pleasure. Nick, thanks for having me. Appreciate care, it. everybody. You too. Bye.